All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. I think we will go ahead and get started now. So settle into wherever you are um, and get comfortable. And we're in for a really exciting presentation about targeted reward systems for neurodiverse kids. I wanna welcome everyone today. I'm Sharon Juniman. I'm from The Shadow Project. Shadow Project is a Portland area nonprofit that is committed to making school more accessible and engaging for kids with learning challenges. Since 2003, we've partnered with schools and teachers to support equitable education for kids who learn differently, supporting in that time over 12,000 children. We are so excited to have Michael Fullop join us today. And we're also joined by my colleague, Christina Bazzaroni, who's gonna be supporting things on the technical end. So thank you, Christina, for being here with us. If you would like more information about the Shadow Project's school-based and virtual programs to support children at your school, I'll be putting my contact information uh, on a slide at the end of the webinar, and I'd be happy to talk to with, with you. So let's get started. Um, Dr. Michael Fullop has been part of the Shadow Project family for many years. Mike was a Shadow Project board member um, and now is our psychologist consultant. He has a clinical psychology practice here in Portland where he, among many other things, helps neurodiverse students and families from a strengths-based perspective, supporting students from kindergarten through graduate school to achieve their goals. Mike has a great presentation planned and I'm gonna turn it over to him shortly. First, I wanna let you know that he would love for this presentation to be as interactive as possible. So please write all of your questions and comments in the chat, which you can find by looking for the little speech bubble, depending on how you're logged in, it might be at the bottom or it might be on the left-hand side. Um, also, Mike has shared some wonderful written resources, and that is posted in a link, a Google Drive link in the chat. Um, and we will also send those out with the recording after the webinar is over. So again, Mike, thank you for being our presenter today. And I'm gonna turn things over to you now. Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's weird a little bit because I normally do workshops that are highly interactive. And so uh, this is going to be a little bit weird because it's not uh, as interactive in some ways. All right. Hi. Uh, so this is uh, we're going to talk about rewarding systems more than anything else. Um, I uh, am a psychologist and I really work with kids from six all the way up through 66, I guess. And um, for the most part, um, and rewards obviously are very important as our punishments, but basically um, we're gonna talk about sort of targeting things uh, for rewards. And I'm sure you all have done this in some ways. Uh, I'd like to kind of hear, uh, well, actually what I'm gonna do is that uh, in a second, uh, think about getting uh, maybe uh, some answers to, to the idea of um, what age your kids are. Uh, but for right now, I want to look at this idea of we're going to try to catch kids being good. That's our goal when we're doing any kind of reward system so we can shape behavior. Um, so I'd like to hear um, one thing or a couple of things that if you could write in the chat box that you know that you do well as a parent. So what's one thing you all know if, if, if uh, I don't know if this is go going in there or not, or you could just write it down and um, uh, think about what it is that you feel comfortable about as a parent. Uh, all of us have uh, some skills and some difficulties as well. 
I, by the way, have uh, four children and all they're in their thirties and they're all still doing okay. So I've used a lot of rewards and a lot of punishments with them. So. Mike, we have some great, um, we have some great, obviously uh, very motivated and loving parents in, in the room today. So um, one person says, I listen. Another says, I keep a warm, open relationship with my child. Another says, I compliment a good choice. Show empathy. Nice. Listening, checking in on emotions. Great. Okay. So that's a wonderful list. Um, and the idea of complimenting and praising really is the backbone of doing rewarding. Um, all right, so I'm glad you guys know some things that you do well. That's a hard question often for parents because when I ask them what do you do well as a parent, they usually start with things I don't do well. So I'm happy that you know that there's some things you do very well. So I don't know how many people have seen this before, but uh, I'm gonna show it to you. It's a very short little video. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about it when we're done. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. I'm gonna go do something, and then I'll come back. It's yummy, yummy. Okay, you can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So I thought you'd give me another one. Okay, now you can have both. Okay, so, and by the way, feel free to ask questions as we go. So I'd like a little bit of a probability math quiz. Which is most likely to happen in your house? You can fill in your child's name. They finished their homework without reminding. They finished their reading without reminding. They finished all their chores without reminding. Finishes a TV show without reminding. 
finishing a bowl of ice cream without reminding. Um, I assume that most people are going to say it's a lot easier for kids to do the, the ice cream, the TV, and the chores and reminding and, and homework is much more difficult. Um, okay, so we're talking a little bit about the pre-MAC principle. Uh, this is going to sound like it's very technical, but we're going to get to a different way to think about it. So the pre-MAC principle states, is the higher probability behavior can be used to reinforce a lower probability behavior. I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to have another name for it. It's going to be a little easier to remember. This is grandma, and you all know this in your gut. So, so why, when, and how with reward programs? Uh, so the why of reward programs. Uh, the I like this comic because it's basically telling us that uh, we're gonna this guy's gonna shuttle everything off to his uh, computer and not sort of take advantage of his natural ability to, to do rewards with his kids. And the way I like to think about it is this, is that kids need to know who puts the butter on their bread. And, and we can't want them to just go to the computer all the time or other people to, to get rewards. And you've also established, obviously, caring, loving relationships with your kids. And uh, we can use that in some ways, not in a manipulative way, but in a way that will be helpful. So these are the real formal reasons for our reward programs. Um, the, they really help develop a number of things, uh, something we call self-efficacy, which is just the, not just the, it's the confidence to be able to uh, believe that you can learn or do something. Uh, it also, reward programs tend to help kids do executive skills for better neural connections. Uh, it helps build resilience. When things go bad, uh, reward programs can sort of help them get better at getting through, which is mainly one of the issues. It builds self-reliance and a work ethic. It can also build self-esteem. And I'm not a big fan of the idea of self-esteem without achievement and achievement uh, is something that we try to do with reward programs. And then that tends to build kids feel good about themselves after they have done things. Uh, and it also builds the parent child connections. It, it lets them see how they're valued. And uh, for those of you in the uh, fixed mindset, it helps break a fixed mindset at times. So I think about reward programs like, um, a cast. You kind of wear them for a while and then you remove them once things are healed. Uh, an underlying goal of all reward programs is for kids is, uh, is to have them fade so the kid can do it by themselves without needing external control. Okay, so when should we use them? Hopefully you like this slide. It's very difficult because I have no feedback what you guys are saying or thinking. Uh, these are the ways when we should use them, when you want your child to build skills. When they're a little bit distracted. Uh, when you're teaching to a kid that's not listening. I don't know if you, any of you have that kind of situation. Um, and particularly when the work's really hard for children, uh, which all neurodiverse learners, all kids that learn in a different way, things will be hard. And when the work's frustrating, I, I suspect probably some of you have children that might get a little bit frustrated from time to time with a lot of different things, but maybe homework is one of those, or schoolwork of any kind. Uh, when the deflector shields go up, when your kid is saying, I don't want to do this, I don't want to hear anything you have to say to me. And then I think one of the most important reasons is for when parents become a little bit frustrated 
with their situation. And truly, my children are older, and it's I, I you have smaller children at this point in the age of COVID. I really feel for you. Um, so, so you have to do parenting and keep everyone together. I'm impressed. So, all right. Now I have a little bit of a different um, comic here. Homework time is usually one of those times where kids ha uh, really begin to, uh, if they're going to show frustration, if they're going to show um, difficulties, that's one of the times that uh, children, adolescents can spend two, three, four, five hours before they start to do their work. Uh, even for work, sometimes it only takes 20 minutes. Again, I don't have any feedback right now, but I'm assuming that some of you might have children like that. So how do we do this? How do we set up reward programs that work? Um, I'm going to give you an overview here. I'm not going to give you all the details. And really, most of the reward programs are very idiosyncratic. It sounds very easy to set up a reward program, and many of you probably tried that. They're much more elusive than you would think. Um, and uh, I think they often, it's hard for parents to keep going because they think something is going to work and it doesn't, or it works for a very short period of time and then it stops, or it works for a while and then uh, it works for quite a while and then it stops. Uh, first thing though we do when we have, I'll let you read this comic first. One of the nice things that the Shadow Project does is create, has a goal setting program. Uh, and I always think about goals in terms of uh, menus, and I think about rewards in that as well. Uh, and we also want to have, we want to always, when we're setting goals, uh, to promote a child's autonomy, no matter almost, no matter how old they are, uh, with a set of goals. Two goals if the kid's really small, or four or five goals if they're a little bit older, or a whole set of goals if they're, you know, in their adolescence. But we want them really, we want some things on the goals that they can do easily, some things they might struggle a little bit with, and then uh, some stuff that they're going to struggle to master. Because we want them to work uh, towards those goals. We don't want them to just keep sticking with stuff that they know how to do. Um, And I would say it's important to remember goals are depots. They're not destinations. They're, they're, uh, there's going to be a whole spectrum of things kids go through before they get to uh, the idea of having self-regulation. So go back to the marshmallow movie. Uh, there's a lot of research that tells us that having children that have better self-regulation will do better in a variety of things, school, uh, is, is certainly one of them. Homework is one of them. And the more you can sometimes delay gratification, the more you can sometimes uh, tolerate frustration and keep at things, the, um, the better the outcomes. Excuse but me. we have, go ahead. Yep. Somebody in the chat asked if you could go back to the last slide real quick. This one? I think so. That one, no, this one. Oops, sorry, that one. Mm. Further back. Yeah, that's the right one. Thank okay. you. And by the way, these slides will be available if you want. You can have them later. Um, is there a question related to that? Feel free to type any questions into the chat and we'll make sure that um, that Mike gets a chance to ask them, answer them. Yeah, and I cannot see them at this point, so I apologize, but there's no chat box for me. Um, uh, okay, looks like we're, we're good to move on, Mike. All right, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you give some examples of goals is, is a question coming up. Oh, sure. It really depends on 
uh, on your child. I mean, if they're uh, in, in first grade and they haven't learned their letters, let's say, that's a good goal is to be able to learn their letters. If they're in, uh, if they're beginning to read, uh, having, having them spend a certain amount of time reading. Uh, if they're, uh, I, anything that you want them to do, a teacher wants them to do, that you think will be helpful can be put on as a goal, but even more important, uh, we need to elicit as much as possible the goals they want. So you may have a child that um, wants to be able to read or wants to be able to do something like a math problem like their friend can do. Uh, it, so it really depends on what the child wants uh, and uh, even though you may want it, if it's not within the child's realm, then it's going to be much more difficult for the child to um, uh, uh, want it. Although that's the bridge in some ways that we're going to try to do with reward programs. Hopefully mm -hmm. that answered your question. I'll interject to Mike um, that uh, Shadow Project uh, created a, a video to help parents Yep. Um, guide uh, goal setting. And so we'll go ahead and include that um, sure. in the resources that we send out to participants, because it sounds like there's a lot of interest in, in goals here. And, and we have yeah. a whole, um, a whole video about that. So thank and you goals, so much for your questions. Yeah, goals and rewards are in, uh, linked together. Uh, but uh, goals you can think about in some ways, maybe external, uh, or something the child doesn't want to do. Uh, but it's something that you'd like that child to do. So I'm going to move on there. Again, these are depots, they're not destinations. So you guys remember grandma. So actually, I'm sorry, I went a little bit too fast. Um, that's grandma and the premac principle. The reason we're talking about that is High probability behavior can be used to reinforce low probability behavior. Translated, that really means this. You do what I want you to do before you get to do what you want. First you work, then you play. This, I, I know that sounds very simplistic, but that's really important in terms of setting up any incentive system. Um, I always work with a lot of children and families that are dealing with learning disabilities, ADHD, amongst a whole other group of things. And my meta goal always is to increase frustration tolerance and the ability to stay at things and practice. The idea of success is we'd like to think it's easy and goes straight up. In fact, this is really the way it goes with anything that's difficult to do, uh, including, you know, every academic skill there is. And as a parent, it obviously takes hard, a lot of hard work uh, to help your children build self-efficacy, executive skills, resilience, work ethic, and to break mindsets. So now we're going to really kind of delve into a little bit more uh, which I assume that some of you have tried or heard about trying. Um, so uh, when I talk about using chips, I'm talking literally about using poker chips. Uh, I have a bunch of cheap knockoff poker chips that I use for people. Um, and I have sets of them that I give them. Uh, and so, the, and the, one of the reasons, particularly with neurodiverse kids, of all kinds is they're tactile. And you can use uh, uh, you can use beans, beads, script. Uh, again, I like them because they're tactile. And there's also a um, an aspect of providing somebody something and then them being responsible for it. That even if the kid's very, very little, um, this is something that's pretty helpful. Um, So, and here's, I think, probably the most important slide. The chip that we give them, the bead that we give them, 
anything that we're going to be giving to them is not as important as the transaction and the caring relationship. Really, if I, if, if I had to say to you, here's the reason a chip program works, here's the reason an incentive program works, it's because it changes the, the dynamic, the incentive dynamic and the, the relationship dynamic with the child. Uh, all of us as parents, uh, my, uh, my uh, younger, or my son, his name is Harrison and his middle name is Dale. And so you probably will recognize this pattern if you're a parent where you might say, um, Harrison, pick up the, uh, the toys and put them over there. And they haven't done it. And so you're gonna say, Harrison, pick up the toys and put them over there. Harrison, and you can hear your affect going up. Harrison, Dale, as you begin to get more and more irritated, your affect goes up and suddenly the kid does it. And that's a pattern that we see with everybody. And so it, it, it is training you as a parent to get more irritated quicker. And literally one of the reasons that we use chips is so we can slow parents down and focus on what the kid does well, but also uh, breaking down the skill. Hopefully that's clear. Um, when I start to do behavior programs and reward programs with, with people, often what I hear is on the left. People don't have enough, uh, they don't listen, they don't show respect, the kid doesn't give a damn about his homework, uh, you know, all these kind of generic statements that aren't very helpful to guide what we want someone to do. And so any behavioral program we set up, we're gonna to try to do much more specific, um, countable, countable programs. As you can see, if we think about, I'll, I'm gonna define what that is a little bit later, uh, but all of these have something to do with something that we can count. Uh, and. and what we find is if we can get kids to do these in a little bit more reliable way, some of those, the relationship actually changes. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm gonna, well, we're gonna, we're gonna jump, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here, but I'd like you to keep in mind this idea of minding. And I'm gonna define it for you because I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of that at the end and then we'll have some time for questions and talking things through a little bit. So the, the first step is we're always gonna decide on one behavior you'd like to change, or you'd like your child to change. Uh, and we're gonna make it as countable as possible. Uh, this, by the way, is a example of a, uh, a, a chip program, an exemplar that, I, um, that you'll have uploaded for you. And really, uh, you don't have to read all this stuff now, but there's really three ma major steps we're going to find out what the kid likes. We're going to set some uh, behavioral targets to replace the problem behavior. And then we're going to reward them when they do that. So again, that whole idea is to catch them being good. This is uh, the business end of what a, a program looks like. Um, and uh, so, if you notice, this number one behavior up here is minding. The reason we use that is because, sorry, uh, the reason we use minding is because the research tells us if you can get a kid to follow through with what you ask them to do uh, reliably, that is related to a whole range of other behaviors. So literally, I always start with minding because it's easy to turn around generally. Uh, and particularly, the younger the kid, the better. Although People ask me in terms of, uh, uh, does, do these kind of programs work with kids a little bit older? Yes, you may have to adapt things, but generally this, the strategy works. It's, uh, I would say it's not simple necessarily, but it, it, it can work if you, um, if you are precise enough with it in some ways. Now, so the reason- Can I, I, can I interrupt for a second? Uh -huh. Sure. 
when you talk about minding, I, yeah, I know. I'm going to define it okay. later. Gotcha. I'm going to go back, and that's going to be their task, okay? So I'm, I'm deferring to that. I just want you to notice that when I talk about minding, I'm talking about it because it's linked to something in research that tells us if you can get your kid to do that, you're going to be uh, well down the road. Because uh, many parents say, you know, my child, child won't listen to me. Uh, I don't know, these are uh, some behaviors that we use. You can see that I have them related. Uh, we have them kind of chunked into self-regulation, the various routines that kids have, uh, and uh, what I call chores. Oops, sorry. Uh, chores. Uh, and then school and homework behaviors, because these are usually the most important ones as well. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a big overview. So the idea uh, where we normally start in some ways is what do we want kids to earn? Uh, that's how we get a child to say, if, if, you, if you give them a menu about various things that they want to earn, they'll begin to think about it. Uh, these are, uh, this is a little economy essentially that you create and there's virtually no way to figure out where to start with this, um, but all of these can be adjusted such that if we're, I don't know if you can notice, uh, let's see, one, if you go to a sleepover at a friend's house, uh, that costs you 50, 50 chips, let's say, in my system. Uh, but if you have a friend over, it's going to cost you 200 chips. So there's always an economy in terms of we're going to focus on stuff that we want the kid to do, not necessarily always going to somebody else's house. But we want, uh, we want sometimes to have a break as well. How did, how did you know it was happening in my home, Mike, uh, this, <laughs> when you yeah. chose this comic? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want to break and, and ask about questions at this point. If people have questions or uh, I, I feel like I'm really disconnected from this in some ways, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the share and just see where people are. Um, and yeah, we... We um, feel free, everyone, to put in questions that you have um, that you have so far that you want to ask Mike. Um, I know, I know one. While we're giving people a chance to think, I know one of my questions is um, when it's a behavior that was um, kind of seemed mastered, and then. Um, and then the child goes back to not doing it again. And in, in my home, it would be um, like hygiene, you know, regular hair washing, regular, you know, without reminding that kind of thing. So I thought that was all mastered, but, um, but now, and maybe it's COVID, uh, my child has stopped doing it. Yeah, uh, the definitely, uh, what we want to do is, you know, for kids that are struggling with a lot of different types of behaviors, including hygiene, homework, um, uh, you know, picking things up around the house. Uh, uh, often the kids that I work with, uh, the parents just tell me that as they walk in the house, they can see a trail of things that, that are there as the child uh, comes in and they stay there. So, uh, uh, and I think COVID is a good reason that people have regressed. That said, COVID is going to be over at some point, so you definitely want to be able to get them back to where they were before. Um, so yeah, we, sometimes when, they, uh, uh, when they've lost those or seem to have lose them, we'll go back and redo a, a little part of a behavioral program. Actually ask a really good question here. And he said, you mentioned that you start with one behavior, but the list you showed had many behaviors. Does the list gradually go over time? Yes, I'm going to go uh, back and share here if I can. So yeah, there's a ton of behaviors on here. Um, but 
I literally will start with minding. That is, uh, 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 whenever I do a behavioral program with someone, I start with this behavior we call minding. And I have parents track a few other behaviors, but I don't try to get them to change anything. I try them to get them to um, uh, observe essentially, become a social scientist uh, for a couple of weeks because A, strategically it takes the pressure off and B, it uh, gives us a lot of good information. And I'm gonna show you that process, but, so, but yes, minding is always the first one. This would be in a third week. Uh, the first week would be based on one behavior. And for me, it's always minding. Uh, you could do other ones, but again, it's, it's uh, linked to so many different things that are positive. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, okay, so what I'd ask you to do at this point is, um, and I'm going to define for you what minding is. Um, and when we talk about tracking behavior, the, the, the system that I was trained in, and the system actually was started, by the way, in Oregon, uh, in Eugene, Oregon, uh, and the people that started it, Jerry Patterson and John Reed, um, they are, you all have heard the next two words I'm going to tell you. Uh, you've heard of this. They actually developed it. Uh, and they developed a lot of the point chart kind of stuff. They developed a th something called timeout, which you may or you probably believe in some ways that you've been taught it at some point. Most people don't know how to do it in the correct way. But my point is they, uh, they developed the research. It's been going on for about 40 years now. It is a fascinating and really powerful program uh, set of research programs that helps us really understand what happens both positive and negative in families. And when I was saying it was linked to uh, a, a whole rash of behaviors, we know that minding is linked to, uh, if, if you can't get your child to mind, it's probably gonna create some tension. You're gonna snap at the kid, the kid's gonna snap back. There's gonna be a continual chain of interactions that occur that therefore uh, make it so that there's longer and longer interactions that are kind of negative. The whole goal of their program, and, and, um, and they were also working with parents that they started to work with the most difficult parents there were, uh, which were, they took from the court, kids were, in those days were called juvenile delinquents. And they took, uh, these were also children that were probably highly, probably being abused. Uh, they didn't use that term, they just taught them these skills. And so when I'm talking about minding, that's the system I'm linking to because I know how powerful it is. It works a whole lot better with, with, with parents that have some resources and, and have skills, but it works really well across the board. So here's what I would challenge you to do or to think about doing. Um, uh, we can think about this as following directions, as following directions intervention. Um, the first time following directions. And, and I'd like you to think about just for a second, how many times has your child uh, follow through with what you ask them to do the first time you ask them to do it? Uh, if someone can maybe give me a, a rate, maybe tell me how old your child is and tell me um, how often they'll, that you would estimate that they do that. You see, we, we, someone says their child is 15. Uh -huh. uh, this parent has to ask twice. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and 50, so that's 15%. I have to ask twice. Okay. But twice is not bad necessarily, but what most parents have to do is ask multiple times. Over I think it depends on what it is. Yeah. Uh, this, another yeah. person says eight and five year old, I have to ask four over to five times. Over and over. Right. Okay. Eight six have to ask over and over. Okay, well, let's go back to pre my or let's go back to grandma's rule. If you ask them, would you go get a bowl of ice cream? Uh, what would? How many times would you have to ask? <laughs> so you know these rates here. By the way, sixty percent, fifteen percent, twenty five percent. Once, whatever you're doing, we should do more of that. That's great. Um, 
uh, and um, these are at best, 60% is uh, close to random. It's not quite random, but it's close. And normally people have to go and say this again and again and again. Uh, so this is the intervention we're gonna, I'm gonna challenge you to do. Uh, and th so this is gonna be the first time following directions. So I'd like you to ask your child's name, fill in your child's name. Uh, uh, I'm just reading what I said. My child's 12 and it takes one to five times. He says slow processing is more motivated to preferable activities. And although the slow processing that you're talking about is not necessarily, is not based on mental processing, it's based on visual spatial uh, symbol processing. And so uh, he, I'm gonna bet it's male or female, he's gonna have a much easier time and not have a slow processor, so to speak, when there's preferred activities. Uh, and, all right, and so let's go back to this. So first time following directions. What I'm gonna do is ask you whatever your child's name is. So I'll use Harrison in this case. So I'm gonna ask Harrison calmly to do something. And the reason I say calmly is it, uh, often we are harried. We have a lot of things to do in life. And it's very difficult at times to be clear about what we're, asking someone to do, not that we always have to be clear, but uh, in this particular uh, intervention, what I'd like you to do is for a couple of hours a day, and this is how we do it, we do it for a couple hours a day, I'd like to ask the child to do something. I don't care what it is, it's to pick up a dish and put it somewhere else. It's uh, to turn off the video game and come. It's to uh, 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 run down and get your socks and put them on. And I'm gonna have you literally count. And I, it's, it's important that you count like this. One, two, three, four, five. Now I, you notice, hopefully you can see me, I'm putting my fingers in front of my face. Um, I do this, we do that because, and I'm telling you behind the scenes, it's to slow the parent down. Because if you don't do it, if you begin to say another thing, the child's not listening, they haven't moved, I guarantee you're going to get snappy or snippy and say, Jimmy, 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 and your affect's gonna go up. They're finally gonna hear, unfortunately, it's gonna reinforce them or reward them for uh, listening to only when you're cranked up. So, gonna go back here. So you're gonna ask them calmly to do something you're gonna count with your fingers in front of your face because otherwise you'll forget to do it. Don't say anything else. If Jimmy does it or starts to do it and then finishes it, hand him a chip, a bean, whatever you've decided to use and do it a couple hours a day. It, I guarantee your child was gonna ask you, why are we doing this? What is this? What is this bean? What is this chip? And I would be mysterious at that point and say, I'm not sure this crazy psychologist told me to do it. And uh, I'm, I, I, it may be worth something at some point. Okay, and so what, um, so what I would really want you to do then, they're gonna ask, I'm gonna do it for a few days. And if you do what I ask within the time frame, I'm gonna give you that chip. And then uh, if you uh, feel like you've done it a few days and you get a little bit of success, I would create a little menu of a couple things that they might want to earn. And we're, I'm going to run back to that slide very quickly. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff on here to earn. Some of it is, is cost money, but there's a lot of stuff that is much lower cost that we want to really focus on kids getting. And uh, someone asked a really good question in the, uh, set of questions that Sh Sharon sent me. And the question is, uh, uh, so the question, it's not phrases a question, it says, my child isn't really motivated by rewards, things, screen time, money. How do I find things to motivate positively? And what I, uh, I believe, and I think this is pretty well documented, everyone's motivated to do something. And uh, there's a couple of strategies that we use to find out what your child's motivated to do. And you, um, I assume most people are going to say screens at this point. 
because um, that's something that kids get to do a lot. Uh, but the strategies uh, generally uh, is you're going to kind of carefully track what the child does for a week and just watch them and see what they go to. And they may be on one thing for a while. Uh, remember, going back to the high probability events, high probability things can be used to reinforce low probability things. So in, in uh, real language, that means cleaning a room can be used as a way to, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the chore, and you want the child then, they're gonna make you get some kind of reward for that. And, uh, but anything that a child does, uh, we can use as a reinforcer, and they're gonna howl because suddenly we're moving that from a, um, a freebie to a, um, a, a uh, something that they now have to pay for. That could create a lot of stress, but the reality is, um, that's the way we can help shape them towards some goals that both they have and we have. Uh, James so, has a question. Um, she's going back to the, the previous slide of the steps, and she's wondering how long you should wait before you start counting, or is that something that you just immediately do after you ask the child to do whatever it is you want to do? Yeah, it's a couple hours a day. I mean, we try and do it usually what's called the power hour around dinner time uh, when kids are coming home from school, which they're not doing that now. Uh, yeah, any, anything in this period of time, uh, you can uh, ask them. And again, it could be something really benign. Open the refrigerator, uh, take out the milk and put it on the table and start to count. But they're going to say, what the, he what the heck are you doing? Why are you doing that? You just tell them that uh, you went through a, a workshop and this is something you're going to consider for a while. Um, and so I, I would say for that couple of hours, try to um, uh, start relatively immediately. You know, uh, often parents will say, well, I, I have to go get their attention. Well, uh, I, unless your child is having significant hearing problems and they've been tested then you can assume that they hear. Because again, if you say, would you like to have ice cream? Would you like to start on a screen? Would you like to go out and uh, run around the, the block uh, and, uh, and not wear a mask, let's say? All of those would be, I think, high probability that they would probably uh, want to do it. Uh, and, and so you can mix in stuff that's, uh, that you can you think they would want to do and stuff that they uh, they might not want to do. Um, and your task is really to be a detached scientist, to step back and to say, I'm going to ask this, and I'm going to count to see if you do it. Um, and let's see, that the, uh, the, the, you're going to give them a chip if they do it. We'll try and figure out something, but I, I, will, I will show you what I would normally do um, to, uh, to how we sort of start this uh, a program. Uh, but I'm going to jump to the end of the here because I think we're almost running out of time. We probably have a few more minutes. Um, so these are just some of the skills. These are some of the uh, books that are very helpful. Um, and and um, uh, this is my last, next to last slide, I guess. If you want to get in touch with me, um, these are the ways you can do it. And I think that that is my last slide. And I want to say one more thing for anyone that wants to uh, uh, stay around for a little bit uh, about where we'd start this and what your behavioral tracking should be. So but I'm going to, whoops, I don't want to do that. Yeah, so <clears throat> we have a few minutes if um, folks want to stick around and, and ask a few more questions. As long as we have Mike here, it's a, it's a great opportunity. He's obviously full of great information for us. Um, My so, 
While you're thinking, um, folks, if you have any more questions, some of the questions that people sent in prior to the webinar um, are how flexible should reward systems be? Yeah, and there is a sheet that I filled out about all of my answers for these questions. They were great questions, and I was going to try to um, uh, weave that in, but it was a little bit harder than I thought. So here's my answer to how flexible. Uh, it's it's really important that the, the system is very flexible. That doesn't mean you have to be flexible with the outcome, but it does mean that if the, if the kid's not getting, uh, excuse my language, sucked onto the system, the system's not set up correctly. We know how to get kids uh, to, to change, and these systems tend to work, uh, but the basic rule of thumb is if our system's not work, working, we have to change the system uh, because we're not using a strong enough reinforcer. And some kids, that I, I work with a lot of kids who have a very hard time with rewards and punishments because of the neural connections, the social idea of this is connected to this and that's connected to that. It's hard for them. And so they, uh, that's why we got to do stuff that's very high rewarding uh, and very flexible. So hopefully that answered that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. I think what I really appreciate about the, the list that you showed and the chip system is that it does allow for flexibility. So you don't have to identify that one really rewarding thing for your no. child because you could, because they're, they're, they're things that they want to do are going to change. Um, and sometimes it can be hard when you pick one thing, like you pick a game and then all of a sudden that game's not popular anymore and then it's not rewarding. And, um, and yes, I agree. And you got to remember the thing that's really rewarding is your interaction with the child. That if you don't have a relationship, if there's, you know, kids, there are some kids that are uh, very difficult to connect with. But I'm, for the most part, if you have a uh, even somewhat positive relationship with the child, it's about the change of the interaction. Because if you look at things a little bit differently, they'll look at things a little bit differently as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I, we're, we do have time for another question or two. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat. I could, I'm going to pick up one here. Someone asked about um, how do you deal with uh, siblings? So if you start a program with somebody and the, child, uh, the sibling says, oh, that's not fair. Um, normally I'd say, please raise your hand if that's ever happened, but I can't do that here. Uh, I like this one basically because uh, if the kid says, the, the sibling says, I, that's not fair, my response is always going to be okay um that's fine you want to earn some things too and we'll start to create a list for them to earn and we'll create a list of their responsibilities no matter how old they are uh, so we're going to use competition i want to say one other thing about this is the behavioral tracking and this is the step i always do first and i train parents to do the counting and I have them track a minding for about a week, then come back and, and not, not minding and we get a rate. How much is the child uh, uh, falling through and not? And then uh, this is pretty well laid out here. Y you are not exactly doing this because you're giving them a chip if they fall through with this. That'll change the dynamic, but it, it'll still give you some data. So that when, this is one of the things that you have uploaded. You can look at all this and feel free to give me a call if you want uh, or questions or email me if you want about how to do this. So, And Mike, is the, is the minding and starting with the counting is, and you gather that data with the idea of if you, if you gather your data and you find that your child's rate of minding is low, that tells you that you have to first start with minding as a goal. 
Is that the idea? Or if uh, it's but, pretty high, then you then yeah, it's another goal. Uh, I, I, I rarely, rarely in my practice have kids that have uh, rates anywhere, uh, maybe at 50%. Now, and by the way, you may have a child, uh, uh, you may have a child that does, will do a whole lot of chores, let's say. And anytime you ask them, to, they'll do it. But if you ask them to sit down and do their reading or do their homework, suddenly they're uh, not going to fall through. Okay. And so, uh, but we would still, with that case, we'd probably still start out with minding just because it gives us a good way to measure. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Well, thank you. I, um, oh, we have just uh, another question. We'll take a last question that just came in. Mm. Um, <clears throat> what advice do you have for caregivers who are starting this technique with older children or, or foster placement? Uh, yeah, that is a really good one because um, uh, the, um, w with a little bit older, with older children, um, and they may have been through a lot of different stuff. And so it's, it's very hard at times to know where to start with them. Um, if you, uh, here's what I would do. The best place to start would be the book that I recommend is called Families by Gerald Patterson. It's an incredibly old book. It was published in 1973, but it has a few principles in it that are powerful and it will help you walk through how to set up a whole program. Um, it's going to be very basic in many ways, but uh, it, it will it'll make you kind of be a little bit cautious. And that's where I would start, just because you really need to know these principles kind of backwards and forwards. I guarantee your child or a foster child is going to throw you a curveball. And, and there, um, uh, you'll find something that doesn't make sense at times. The author's name, by the way, is the one I'm just talking about. It's called Families. It's a very old book. You can buy it for a penny on uh, uh, Amazon, or but it'll cost you $3.99 to get it shipped to you. Uh, it's, called, it's Gerald Patterson, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N, uh, Families. Uh, the more uh, recent updating of that is called Raising Cooperative Children. All again, started in Oregon, still in Oregon from Research Press. Okay, we Thank have you. one last question, is, which is a great one. Um, how do you eventually wean off the reward system? Uh, well, that's interesting. I work with a lot of children that have type 1 diabetes, and often parents will tell me that um, uh, when we start, they'll tell me that this child shouldn't have to be paid for this because this is going to be something they do for the rest of their life. And my response usually is, let's imagine that you went to work and they told you that we really love your work, but we're not going to pay you anymore. Um, usually people get that pretty quickly that sudden that, um, uh, that we all have incentives throughout our life. And so weaning them towards um, more appropriate behaviors for the kids is often the child will tell you, I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't mean you don't have to do the system, but you may have to, uh, uh, alter the system so that it is more uh, sophisticated with a little bit longer term rewards. Um, although, frankly, older kids at times do respond to even simple uh, things. If you notice things that are going well, if you notice when someone follows through, if you notice they, they did a kindness, that they took care of their brother, and you just notice that, give them a penny, give them a pat, uh, a, a uh, they will like that. And so in some ways uh, we're going to start, uh, we're going to use a system and a concrete uh, token, but really we're trying to change the way that they interact and that you interact with, with kids. So uh, weaning is um, uh, usually, as I said, they're like a cast. And so most of these programs last for a period of time and then they'll fade. Uh, that said, some kids will need them need a lot more cast than others. Uh, but and these systems are not simple to run, and so there's a natural uh, aspect to this 
whereby if they begin to fade, you go on vacation, you, you know, have something that happens, they, they, um, they fade themselves. If the behaviors don't come back that are troublesome, that's good, you can move on. But if they do, you can reinstitute them at that point. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, thank you. That yeah. was great. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for, for joining us and for these um, <clears throat> excellent questions. Um, yeah, we have a lot of comments coming in. Um, uh, saying thank you. So, um, yeah, yeah, great. so we thank appreciate you. that. So that I'm wraps up our anymore, work. Right? Pardon me? I'm not sharing anymore, right? Good. I'm just so that wraps up our conversation with an expert. Um, and as we um, said, we will be sending out an email to all of you who participated today with all of these resources. We'll add in the Shadow Projects video about um, goal setting, which is based on our school-based program, which Mike was a big part of, of designing and refining. Um, and we invite you to go to our website, which is shadow-project.org, where we have other videos about supporting kids with sensory challenges at home during um, stay-at-home orders using the things that you have around your house, as well as other parent support videos. Um, and we have other parent uh, conversations with an expert coming up. And so if you subscribed to our newsletter, then you'll get updates about those. And you can also, um, Caitlin, if you share that um, slide, you can follow us on social media with, um, with, uh, and get more updates. And then if you're interested in learning more about shadow project programs that empower schools to support distance learning, engagement, social emotional skills, and reading proficiency, then my contact information is up there on the screen. And so please reach out to me and I can give you some more information. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your afternoon.